Okay. So, uh, thank you, thank, thank you, all, thank you all for being here uh, today. I wanted to come to this session and uh, kind of also get a sense in, in the room about people's interests and whether people are interested in management um, as, as a career or they're just interested in learning about kind of the role of manager. Uh, so I'll probably stop um, as I go and, and just do a quick poll to understand a little bit about kind of what your interest is uh, in terms of getting from the session. But uh, I want to start quickly with just a little bit about me. So I've been in the industry for 10 years. Uh, I started off as a software engineer. It's a very typical kind of career path for managers to start as, as, a, as an individual contributor and then eventually make their ways into management. Uh, there are definitely other paths, but uh, that, that is one common way in which people go into engineering management. And that, that was actually the case for me. I've actually been uh, doing management for five years now. Uh, so ten, uh, five out of the 10 years that I've been doing this have been actually managing people and managing teams. But I also want to give you a little bit of uh, kind of background about how I entered the software industry because I, I did have a non-traditional path. So I actually went to college and studied environmental science um, as, as, a, as my major. I went to grad school and studied environmental policy. So you may be asking, whoa, how, how, how do you go from you know, being in the environmental field into being into, in the software field? So it, it turns out that when I was in college, I took a business class. And uh, that was really the kind of introduction to me into software engineering, because I was actually working with a team trying to come up with uh, a business plan for a startup, and the team had no skills uh, in terms of the software. We all came from other other backgrounds, whether it was science, uh, you know, the arts, uh, hospitality, and so it, it really kind of forced us to start looking into what it takes to actually build. A, a product using web technologies, right, using software. And that's what introduced me into software engineering. Um, after that, I was like, you know, this, this is just something that is interesting. I think I want to pr probably pursue it a little bit further. Still was really interested in the environmental field, but actually started digging a little bit deeper into it. So that's how, actually how I made uh, the transition from the, being in the environmental field uh, and then eventually being in the software industry. So uh, it t tends to be, not necessarily uncommon that uh, people come from a different background and then end up uh, in the software industry. Just by a show of hands, uh, how many people here have had a similar path where you've come from a non-traditional background? Okay, yeah, so it's not, not too uncommon. Um, and then the last thing about me is that I'm really terrible at making jokes. So I'm not gonna make any jokes today, unfortunately, because uh, I, 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 I'm really terrible. My wife always tells me you have the worst jokes in the world, and the only person that laughs is you. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, apparently that was a joke, you all laughed. Uh, Your wife's joke, though. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so in terms of objectives, what I want to try to get out of today's session is make sure that you all have an understanding of what the engineering management role is all about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about specifics, about what this role is about, right? And hopefully, uh, if you have follow-up questions at the end, I, I'll, I'll try to detail a little bit more about what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. I also want to make sure that we review objectives around management. Why is it that we, we, we want to have this as a practice in the software industry? So I'll cover a little bit of that. And then I'll kind of wrap all of that, all that around a discussion around using principles, really the topic of you know what I want to kind of uh, really uh, discuss with you today that principles are a good way to really deal with a lot of the kind of chaos that the management practice has to, has to really face on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll try to bring it all together around this, this concept of leveraging principles. All right, so I, I mentioned earlier I wanted to get a quick sense from the room just in terms of backgrounds. So it, 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 it's, it sounds like we have some people who have come into the software industry from a non-traditional background, but how many people here are managers or thinking about be, becoming a manager just by a show of hands? Okay, good. 
All right, so then for those of you who are managers or, or even have an interest in management, a lot of this will probably make a lot of sense. Uh, but hopefully then when, when I really get to the, 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 the meat of, of what I want to really portray to you today around principles, then hopefully that, that could also be uh, some new information for you. Okay, so let's jump into just what, what is the management role all about? What, what do engineering managers actually do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? And there are four major functions, right, that engineering managers tend to be responsible for. Uh, the, the, the first one is really a people manager. So as an engineering manager, you have direct reports, uh, software engineers, and so on, that are working with you to carry out projects, to carry out goals, but it's, it's really their careers that is number one for you as an engineering manager. Of course, that's all because you want to make sure that the business achieves their objectives, that the business has the talent to be able to move forward. But as a, people, as a people manager, you really have to care personally about the people on your team. You have to understand you know, what are their needs, what are their motivations. Uh, you have to provide feedback about areas where there are opportunities for improvement and so on. So that's, that's number one. Uh, you really have to do that on a, on a very re regular basis. And there's a lot of different ways that you know, managers can do that. The second big function is that you are a technical leader. You're expected to really solve challenging technical problems. And you may rely on your team to help you do that, but ultimately the buck ends with you. You really have to kind of be the person that's going to set the stage for, for how the technical strategy is going to be executed. Uh, so that's a, another major, major function that a manager has to do. The other one is project manager. And this one is a little bit ambiguous because there are specific roles, right, where that, that is what they do, right? That you have project managers that actually are responsible for the roadmap, they're responsible for making sure that work gets done and, and communicating, etc. But as an engineering manager, you still have to play that role as well. You have to work with them to help inform those plans uh, and you have to own what part of what they do as well. So it's not, it's not something that necessarily you're going to be completely detached from. Uh, it's something that you, you really also have to own. And this varies, of course. There may be teams where really project management is, uh, you know, very well, like from a skill set perspective, very well kind of engaged, and, and you may not have to do as much. But often what, what I've seen in teams is that engineering managers are always also involved with project management. Then the fourth major function is that you're a business owner. So you're not just executing on a technical strategy, you're also executing on a business strategy. So you want to really understand what the business is about, you want to be able to inform the business about what's possible, and you want to be able to also influence the business about, around where you think the strategy should be around. Uh, so that, th those are the, the key major functions you know, that a, an engineering manager, an engineering manager has to deal with on a day-to-day on a -day -day basis. Okay, so I want to review these in a little bit more detail, uh, just to give you kind of a sense of what, what are the components under each of these kind of four major functions. And first, under people management, it's about performance, right? It's about making sure that the team is actually being, is delivering, that uh, you, you are finding opportunities for people to improve, to perform better over time, and when there are uh, so certain areas where the, you, there is underperformance that you actually address them uh, you know, in, in, in a timely fashion. So that's number one. Number two is about career development. You have to start thinking long term for your people. Uh, you, it, it's not just about the day to day and the tasks that have to be done for the next two weeks or for the next month. It's also about the big picture. Where do I see uh, each individual on my team six months from now, one year from now, starting to really think long term about how can you give them opportunities so that they can actually grow and, 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 and gain the skills and the experience that will help them achieve their own career goals. Sometimes it's also about helping them define those career goals, helping them understand where they can go. And, and, and that sometimes it requires that you engage with people, right? Okay. 
The, the third one is hiring and retaining talent. So as an engineering manager, you are always going to be hiring. Uh, there's always going to be uh, you know, cycles where people will look for other opportunities and, and new, there'll, there'll be openings. So you're, you're always going to be hiring, you're always going to be involved with the hiring process. It's not, an, it's not uh, easy to, to hire in, in the software industry compared to other industries. And you're always going to have to deal with retention too, right? Making sure that your people are motivated making sure that you have a, a culture that values people, that people feel like they're being included. Uh, so you really have to work on this uh, on a regular basis. And part of this is also understanding key metrics that give you the signals that things are working or that they're not working so that you can understand where are some areas where I can start improving. The second major function, right, tech leadership. And, and, and this one, it, it, it can be self-explanatory, but it, it's really about making sure that from a technical perspective, you are achieving excellence, that the designs for the systems that you're building, right, for the products that you're shipping are kind of well-rounded, they're robust, they allow for scale, they allow for, main, for maintainability in the, in the long term, uh, and for extensibility too. Uh, it's also about operational excellence. So you want to make sure that you don't just ship things, but that you actually are able to operate them and scale them and minimize disruptions to customers. So that, that is a, a one big um, area that you know, is always one that has contention because you have to really figure out how do you balance developing and extending the products that you're building with actually operating the ones that already exist. Uh, the third is around formulating best practices. So every, every engineering team has a software development life cycle and there are many different components that go into that. Uh, ensuring that you have best practices, make sure that you have consistency, you have standards, you are able to actually achieve quality on a regular basis and that that quality is improving over time. The third major function we talked about, project management. So it's about estimating the work, it's about road mapping, it's about being able to communicate to stakeholders. This is the scope of the work that we're gonna be able to take in and this is how long we think it's going to take. And then providing status updates on a regular basis. Am I missing uh, uh, are dates, key dates uh, uh, that are part of this roadmap or am I actually meeting them? Uh, it's about skills allocation, right? So teams have diverse skills and problems require sometimes uh, uh, different, different skill sets. So you, you have to understand what kind of skills exist in your team so that you're able to actually allocate them. And, and thirdly, as I mentioned, communication. Communication is key. So whether it's status updates, whether it's communicating risks and challenges, whether it's communicating big wins, whether it's communicating a major theme uh, or, a, or trying to inspire your team, you always have to be communicating. Uh, and then fourthly, dependency management. So you as a team may own very specific systems or products, but you may depend on others. And so you have to work with other teams um, and make sure that your roadmap is aligning with the roadmaps of those other teams. And often that requires uh, you know, negotiation, and making sure that you build relationships across teams. Lastly, as a business owner, you have to make sure that you're able to track impact, right? So what is the impact that I'm having on our customer base, on the key metrics for the business? You need to be able to stay close to those and, and be able to track them on a, on a regular basis. It's about planning and strategy. So what, what is the year-long plan and what's the strategy? that we're gonna be leveraging to actually actually execute that. Uh, how is the, org the organization set up so that we can actually achieve certain goals? Uh, and this usually involves a, a, a number of different disciplines. It's not something that is just engineering related, but as an engineering manager, you play a big role in making sure that that happens. And lastly, organizational design. So is the organization set up in an optimal way to deliver on the goals? you often have to be thinking about whether, whether it is or not and whether there are opportunities to improve the organization so that you can actually achieve the goals. And, th and the strategies that, you, that your business actually wants to execute informs a lot about how your organization is set up. 
And I, I touched a little bit on negotiation in terms of cross-team dependencies, in terms of actually uh, understanding what is in scope for what can be achieved. Uh, so this is also something that as a manager you have to deal with on a, on a regular basis. All right, so those are the kind of the major functions. So what are the actual objectives of, 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 a, of management? Why is it that we need engineering management? So obviously organizations need accountability. So if, if you're a, 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 head, a head of a department and you have an engineering team, how do you know that that engineering team is executing? Right? Uh, how do you know that things are going well, that uh, dates are going to be uh, hit, for, for shipping new features, for shipping new products. You need someone to be accountable for that. So an engineering manager is, is someone who can actually make sure that the work is executed, but it's also someone who is accountable for that work. Um, attracting, retaining, and growing talent. I talked about this. This is essential for every business in the, in the, in the software industry. This is one of the most important uh, aspects you know, of, of making sure that you can compete is that you are able to attract good talent and you're able to actually grow it and, and, and retain it. Uh, it. It's true that often the, the, the best teams are the ones that attract the best talent, right? And, and so this is one, one key reason why you want um, engineering management to be able to, re to be responsible for that. Uh, third, delighting customers at scale, right? It requires um, that you build systems that are robust, that are extensible, uh, and that have very little downtime, right? That they're reliable. So ha thinking about how is it that I'm going to actually architect a system or architect a number of systems that are behind a product is really key. And it, it does require someone that can bring together different skill sets, that can look at different ideas and assess which ones are worth, worth actually uh, pursuing and leveraging data to actually make informed decisions. And lastly, you want to inform what's possible. If, if uh, you're a head of a, if a sales department, you may not know technically what is possible. You, you need someone to be able to tell you that, to be able to look deep say, hey, this is what we want to achieve. Can we actually achieve this given the, the people that we have uh, on, uh, on, on site? And, and an engineering manager is going to be able to, to inform whether or not something is feasible. Okay, so again, the key objectives of management, right? So you, it's about executing on goals. Uh, you want to make sure that business objectives are, are, have a number of individual goals spread across teams that are rolling up to that business objective, and engineering managers are carrying out the execution of those, of those specific goals. Um, you want to be able to grow talent, because without it, obviously, you can't achieve your goals. So that, that is another key objective. Thirdly, you want to achieve scale. If you want to really reach a large audience, you have to be able to achieve scale and you have to be able to build systems that can do that. And finally, you, you want to be able to innovate. This, the, the software industry is one where you have to constantly innovate, you have to constantly simplify processes, you have to simplify experiences, you have to reach out into the mind of customers and understand what their needs are and understand what are the tasks that they're taking, what is their user journey and what kind of gaps there exist and to be able to, to close some of these gaps and tap into some of these opportunities, you have to be able to innovate, you have to be creative and, and think about ways to improve. All right, so all of that, I know probably didn't really touch much on the, the, the actual topic of, you know, of today's session, but I really wanted to make sure you had the context about what it is that an engineering manager does. Uh, and so, the first thing I think that, at least for me, comes to mind, thinking about you know, everything we just reviewed, is that the engineering manager has to deal with a lot. You have to deal with, a little, you carry, a lot, carry on a lot of different hats, right? Uh, you have to, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, context switch a lot. Uh, and all of this 
result in a lot of chaos, potentially in very stressful, stressful situations, right, where uh, you may feel like you're overwhelmed. And, and this, this particular role is, is one of those roles where it's unique in that sense, in, in the sense that you do have to carry uh, and wear um, a lot of these different hats, and you do have to context switch a lot. It's, it's one of the most complicated uh, management roles you know, in, in, in the industry. So to be able to actually make some sense of, of, of all that and make sure that you, you are saying principles are, are, are a good instrument to be able to, to do that. Um, I'll start this kind of discussion with this quote from Ray Dalio. I don't know if uh, um, you, you know, probably, you probably do. Uh, but it's a really good quote and it, it, it really kind of summarizes what I, the way I see principles. Principles are ways of successfully dealing with reality to get what you want out of life. Obviously this is very general and, and can apply to a number of, of uh, kind of different circumstances, but it also applies to the engineering management role. Uh, in, in a world where you're, you are dealing with chaos, where you are constantly context switching, where you're constantly trying to prioritize what is the next thing that I need to do? What's the most important thing I should be doing right now? It's important to have some guardrails that can help you make decisions about what, is, what should I be doing right now or what should I be doing next week. And, and principles are those, those guardrails. So why principles? So the first thing is that decision making is hard. Uh, I'll give you an example. You have a project that has to be executed, let's say, um, by the end of February. And you have a uh, limited number of people, and you also are, are, are being tasked with a specific goal. You have to figure out what the scope of the work is. You have to work uh, with your project manager, perhaps, to and, and your product managers to understand the requirements, to understand the roadmap. Uh, how do you make a decision about how how, how you're going to allocate skills to meet that particular project, and at the same time, make sure that you're continuing to hire, make sure that you're continuing to grow talent, make sure that you're giving opportunities to people who want to grow. Right on a on a regular basis, you you can't make the decision to just say everybody now is going to work on that particular project, because you it, it may turn out that that project doesn't really fit well with some of the kind of uh, growth opportunities that you've laid out for your people. So you already right there have some conflicts. How do you resolve them? Right, you have to make decisions, and decisions uh, you know in, in in scenarios like that are really hard to make. And you always want to be, be doing the, the best that you can. You want to make sure that you are doing the best for everybody, right? You want to make sure that you hit the business goal. You also want to make sure that, that you are growing your talent, that you're continuing to operate your current products, uh, that you're continuing to hire. So you have a, a number of different streams of work that you have to consider. Uh, the, the other thing is that business is always changing. It's always changing. Priorities change. Customers change trends change, et cetera. And you, uh, this often means you get new information, but it also means that you have to be open to change. And as, as you probably may, you know, may, may think or know, humans don't love necessarily change. Uh, we, we like stability, we like uh, comfort, right? And, and so if you, if you are in, in a place where things are changing all the time, uh, it can feel overwhelming, and uh, how do you deal with that, right? And then the reality is that work can sometimes sometimes be stressful. You may be overwhelmed. Uh, you may have all these different streams that you are responsible for, and how, how do you deal with all that? Uh, so the reason, I think one, one key reason why principles are good is that Humans are you know, really good at leveraging tools. We love to have tools. We love tools because they show us a path forward, because they help us uh, get something done, uh, and they remove some of the uncertainty that we would have if we didn't have the tools. So principles are part of that toolkit that can help remove some of the uncertainty, that can help you feel that, yes, I am making the right choice, 
here because I have these principles that I follow and, and that I've thought about and, and they're grounded on what I believe is, is the right thing to do, not just for the business, but for our people, for, for, my, for myself as an individual, right? And for the world at large. All right. So all this to say is that principles really bring peace of mind in, in a world where you have a lot of chaos. They really help you kind of ground yourself on uh, some key tools that allow you to make decisions, allow you to keep moving without feeling like, whoa, you know, I'm about to hit a cliff, or, uh, or I'm about to jump off a cliff, or I'm about to hit a wall. Uh, and, 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 and again, the engineering management role is one where you will always feel like that. And so you need, uh, you need tools that can help you make sure that you're able to surmount them. So, so what, what are some examples that I like to think about? So first one that I like to really, this one I hold very, very dear to me, um, having positive bias. And having positive bias means when you work with others, oftentimes you will have conflicts, oftentimes there will be miscommunications. And positive, having positive bias means that you, you, you always take a step back and try to understand what was the intent of a, of a person when a person says something that maybe I took the wrong way. And what that allows you to do is to say, hey, um, I just want to ask a clarifying question. I, I, this is what I understood. Is the intent of what you wanted to say X, Y, Z? You want to make sure that you, 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 you have the ability to take that step back and be able to ask questions like that before understanding something in a different way and potentially creating you know, an escalating conflict that can lead to unproductive work or unproductive dis discussions. So this is one key principle that I hold very dear because often in business, uh, miscommunication happens all the time and it's, it's easy to misinterpret something that someone may say as, as, a, as something negative and you want to have positive bias to really understand what is the intent. Because 100% of the time, not 100%, but most of, most of the time, people do have good intent and they actually want good things. They, they, want, they, they want to achieve the same goals you want to achieve. They may just have different perspectives and different opinions, but they always have the same intent. So this is one key principle that I, I hold very dear and I think is really key. Uh, second one is that Insisting on learning helps you make sure that even when you fail, even when you make mistakes, you look at those as a learning moment. Uh, or even when someone on your team makes a mistake, that you look at it as a learning moment and you're able to give the feedback and say, hey, you know, this is something that happened. This is a learning moment. How can we do this better the next time? Uh, and, and, and so, Keeping that as a principle that, that you can always go back to helps you reframe a lot of things that uh, may come across as, well, you know, I, I, this, this didn't go right, uh, this is terrible, we are terrible, or I am terrible. No, let's turn that on its, on, on its head and think about it as a learning moment. Third is uh, you want to emphasize people's strengths. Oftentimes it's easy to get bogged down on the negatives on the weaknesses, right? And just because it's easy to, to see, um, and it also is easy to see that that is poss possibly the thing that may be impacting a particular task or a particular goal. But the reality is that people have strengths, right? You hired uh, individuals because they have very specific strengths. And we tend to overlook those strengths sometimes. And it's important as an engineering manager, especially, to understand what are in each, each individual strengths, because you can apply those strengths in different areas. So making sure that you emphasize people's strengths is, is, is an important principle that I like to follow, uh, despite being, being, having as a context, hey, these are some weaknesses, some areas where we can make some improvements, but here are some areas where we're really strong. And here's, here's a very clear need where this strength can be applied. So trying to emphasize people's strengths can sometimes balance out of the view that you may have, you know, of either an individual or a team, uh, or even another team that you may be working with. 
being data driven, I, I think is, 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 a, is a huge principle. You want to always be data driven. A lot, a lot of times, you may have an idea, you may have some anecdotes, but you have to ask the question, how can I back this with data? Is, 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 can we actually um, bring data to bear to this particular uh, idea or this particular topic? So being data driven really helps ensure that you have the confidence that you need to be able to make decisions. And lastly, uh, change is okay. So I mentioned earlier, business is ever changing. Change is okay. If you keep that as a principle, you'll be easy, it'll be easier for you to accept that when it does happen, and it'll be easy for you to understand that it's gonna be okay. That yes, uh, things change and uh, it feels uncomfortable, but hey, it, this always happens, it's okay. All right, so in summary, so we, we can go into questions. So the engineering ma ma management role is multifaceted. You're gonna wear a lot of different hats. Uh, and that makes it for a somewhat chaotic uh, kind of role. M uh, but ha management helps fulfill uh, key business objectives, and that's always important to <coughs> keep in mind. Uh, and then lastly, principles are there to really help bring peace of mind. That, that, that is the essential reason why you want to use principles in your management practice. Um, if you are considering being a manager, if you are a manager, Think really hard about what are, my, what are my values, what are my beliefs, and what kind of principles can I define to help me deal with the complexity of the role. And again, you, you make your own principles, right? You can draw on, 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 on others, but they're yours. They're there because they are grounded on what you believe, on what you value, and so you should come, with your, you should come up with your own principles and, and, and really refine them as you go. Hey, th th is this principle really working for me? Has it helped me? No, maybe I'll scratch it. But actually, here's, here's I think, a, a good thing that I think I should be keeping uh, in mind as a result of my own experiences. I'm gonna, I'm gonna define that as a new principle that I'm gonna follow. All right, and with that, we have uh, about 14 minutes or so. So, any questions? Or comments even? Yeah. Uh, question, comment. Uh, you mentioned in, in this scene that NJ Manager is having technical leadership on the team. Though I feel like in a bunch of situations I've been in, it was more there's one or two people who are really the software architects on the team who are on the technical leadership, and the managers might actually not have any really technical depth at all and much more focused on the people side. So one maybe. First, the question is like, you know, to me, sometimes a lot of these things are actually divided up, and the manager might be more focused on people. Maybe comment on your your context for yeah. how you see this. And then the other thing, uh, question for you, as you transition from software engineering to management, you know, I, I you said that was kind of a common career path, uh, but I also see like a lot of people end up doing it badly. And do you did you you know undertake some particular training or or something that helped you? Maybe you know, develop these principles or develop techniques for managing people that you see other people are not necessarily getting when they try to take on that management role. Sure. Yeah. And the, the first one is a good comment because mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Depending on uh, you know the the business you're in, it's possible that engineering managers are really more focused on on people, and they rely on tech leads and so on to really drive kind of the technical strategy forward. Uh, so that is that is absolutely valid, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there are cases where also the it is true that the uh, manager is also very involved in kind of the high level um, technical strategy. You can go both ways, mm -hmm. uh, and then on the question, uh, the second question on the actual question. So yes, I, I think it does help to mm -hmm. have uh, some training uh, to start with. I happen to get some uh, before I actually. Uh, you know, pivoted to into software, but I also took quite some time to build up my own skills mm -hmm. uh, via working on my own projects, via uh, collaborating with others, um, observing other other engineers. Uh, not necessarily yet um, in in a software uh, kind of environment, software development environment. So I 
that helped a lot, and I think that is instrumental to be able to observe that, to actually have mentors who can, who can coach you, who can give you advice. That is very key to being able to at least transition from a non-traditional um, kind of a, a career path into the software industry. And then I think as, as you become a manager, it's, it's more important to also have mentors and have people who can give you advice uh, and to seek training. So management is one of those practice, practices where you're not going to get very good training uh, you know, uh, out there. right? You, you may go to school and uh, have a computer science major, uh, but you're not going to have an engineering manager, management major necessarily. right? You may go to business school, that might help. But engineering management is something that you really develop through practice and through training. And uh, some companies will provide some of that training which is good, but other times you have to try to learn yourself, right? Again, going back to that principle about insisting on learning, uh, making sure that you know, <laughs> when you do find that there is something that you can learn, you actually go out for it and you try to understand how, how, do pe how have people dealt with this particular situation. Uh, you, it's good to have a network of, of uh, other managers that you can rely on, uh, that you can say, hey, uh, you know, I, I have this particular you know, uh, situation, how can I best kind of uh, work around it or work with it? And, and that has been really, really helpful for me. I've always had a network of other managers that I can rely on, and uh, that, that has been, you know, invaluable. So, thank you. First, I want to say I really appreciate your presentation. You did a great job, and I, I think you had a series of call them a higher level, easy to consume slides that actually had a lot of depth and a lot of very thoughtful ideas in them. So thank you. And I, I like your principles a lot. You know, maybe the one thing I wanted to ask your thoughts about, something that I often think about, is that with people problems and with technology problems and with business problems. Often, the problem that's first presented to you is not actually the problem that needs to be solved. And it takes a while to tear into that and understand what's the real underlying problem to the situation. So I, I think of something about like the why and understanding the deeper why of, of well, you know, again, technical, business, and people problems. And I wonder, you know, I, I feel like you've definitely hinted at that in the talk. Um, but I wonder, do you see that as maybe another principle, or do you see that as kind of implied in the principles that you have laid out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I think in part it could be implied in, in if you, I'll go back to the being data driven kind of principle. And if you, if you take a data driven approach and you ask that question why, you may then ask as a secondary question, what's the data uh, that can help me answer this question? And, and that might be, I have actually used that myself in the past because I've had uh, for example, uh, not necessarily product managers, but I've worked in uh, publishing before, so I've had newsroom stakeholders coming to me and say, I want to do this. And, and uh, the question of why comes up, and they can answer it, but I still don't understand. It's not a, a clear answer to me, it's a good idea, and maybe it, it may work. But then I go back and say, what's the data that you have to back this up? And sometimes you don't have the data, sometimes you have to go with instinct, and that's okay. Uh, you understand the business, uh, and you can make a decision, but often if you do have the data, it's good. It's good to say, hey, I also have this, this data point, uh, maybe it sits with uh, my instinct, maybe it doesn't. Ultimately, it's good to have, you can discard it if you feel you still have an instinct that this is the right thing to do, but you can ask, hey, what, what, what data do we have to back this up? So I think being data-driven is, is a good principle to always try to dig a little bit deeper and, and try to answer that, that big question of why. Um, we can probably refine that and, 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 and find other ways to help inform how you can answer that question. Mm -hmm. But that is one that I, I, would, I, would, I would just suggest, because uh, it, it, at least in my experience, um, it has proven useful to always and that, in the case I mentioned, we were, we, we, we were able to say no, you know, there's no data backing this, and actually uh, there, there's other opportunities that make more sense, the data's telling us, and they, were, they understood it, and we actually took a different direction. So sometimes that helps. That's 
great example. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess I guess the the question that I have here is is really a how to the question, which is what the other other questions are like. Like, would you be willing to share like the first time you did this, you, you made decisions at this level, and how that worked out for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it was probably in a situation. It goes back to the positive bias principle, having positive bias. Uh, I was in. A team where uh, I had a tech lead that didn't actually report to me but worked with me but had a, a different way of expressing things and of, of uh, trying to relay his views uh, on you know, different ideas etc and it was it was very easy listening to someone uh, express themselves in, in, in that way to feel like either you're being attacked or to feel that uh, there's a lot of negativity um, and so on. And, ha and, and actually relying on this principle allowed me to kind of say, wait, yes, this is uncomfortable, but this person is a tech lead. This person has really good ideas. Uh, this person has a good viewpoint. Let me just try to understand exactly what they intend to do. And, 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 and that was, uh, I think, Good because without having done that, I think it, you know we, we wouldn't have had a, the relationship that we ultimately ended up having through you know my my stay at that at that company, where we I understood that it it was just a sometimes a communication thing, but the intent was always good. It was always positive, and I always used that principle to come back and say, hey, I, I really want to understand what it is that that uh, that you want your you intent to say here. I'm going to try to put some of this other stuff out, out uh, to you know on the curve and really get to the to the meat to the heart of what what it is that we're talking about. So that was one case. Uh, I, I can probably think of others, but uh, that being one one uh, one that I face repeatedly all the time, uh, <laughs> it, it it's the one I kind of just thought about. Great, thanks to answer that. Yeah. Okay. My question was very similar. Um, and I guess I'd like to ask the same thing in, in a broader sense, which is, let's say I define my principles and I, you know, I want to fixate on them. I, I'm afraid they'd be like New Year's resolutions, like, oh, I'm going to eat healthier, and then a week later I forget them. Yeah. Do you use like techniques or exercises to sort of re-emphasize them in your professional life? Yeah, I do. I print them out. <laughs> That's one. Okay. And that way, like, you know, I, I put them on my desk and, you know, I, I'm... I'm doing something that I oh okay. reminder. So I try to I try to make sure that I I, I put into my schedule reminders uh, that that can help me. Sometimes I, I I follow them. Sometimes it's just there, and I'm like, you know what? This is not, no, I, I don't want to read that right now. Um, I don't care. Like this is how I feel right now, and and that's okay. Uh, but I think the point is to to try to practice it. And to try to you know improve your, your usage of the principles so that over time you it becomes a habit uh, and and that's what happens ultimately if you if you try to, if, if you keep reminding yourself and practicing it, be, it becomes a habit. Yeah. Could yes. I get something for that real quick? Because just because I have so much passion around that particular question, um, I think there's a life principle that goes beyond the engineering principles that's be kind to yourself. People are very hard on themselves often, and I feel on the days when I fail at living up to whatever principles I have, I'm very discouraged. Your analogy of the New Year's resolution was very good. But then I try to remember, next day I'm going to wake up and take a fresh crack at it. And I'm going to do it again, and maybe I'll foul it up that day too, and maybe I won't. But I always set that, that notion, whether you print them out, you refresh them each morning or at some point during the day, and then don't kill yourself if you don't quite get it right one day and get on with it the next day. Pretty obvious, I suppose, but I think it's sometimes good to say it out loud. That's a good principle, also. <laughs> you just said, like, don't kill yourself if you know yeah. you're not actually doing, uh, following your principles. It's good. Yeah. Do you do you fashion or create um, the principles for your teams, or like, or that uh, you'd like people to sign on, or you create as a group and uh, then kind of remind that each time you meet together that these are our principles? Kind of, do you do that as well? Yes. 
and, it, and that is also very important as a team to do. Because uh, again, you, you may have a conversation where someone may note like, hey, uh, we have this principle that actually tells us we shouldn't be talking about this or it's veering us into a conversation that doesn't sit, right? And, and then you may be able to, if everybody is in alignment, you may be able to reference that and put the conversation back on track. Uh, whether it's like either like ground rules for, for, for meetings uh, or general overarching principles that the team follows, uh, you could always go back to those uh, and they help make sure that you stay aligned. So and do you, you bring those principles to you or do you ask people to bring all the you know, suggestions to the meeting and you yeah. all take turns picking and then voting? Yeah, usually. The process, I guess. What I'm usually, if, if they. So I. And there's different ways of like naming them. You can call them like tenets, principles, guidelines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, it's good to come with them as a uh, like reach them as a team. And these are kind of principles that you're just going to follow on a week by week basis. When it comes to meetings, uh, same process. You may want to come with them and say, "Hey, you know, here's here's some guidelines that I'd like to have us follow. Um, are we all in alignment?" Um, usually everybody will say yes, and because uh, they sound great. So then, but at least now you, they said yes, and you can kind of go back to them and say, "Hey, we said this, uh, and, and the reason why we said this is because we thought it's important to X, Y, Z. So let's make sure that we we stay within the confines of what was permitted under under those principles." Okay, all right, we're out of time. Thanks so much.